If you clicked on this video, then that means you're trying to see these. Hey guys, welcome back. And if you're new here, we put a video out every Monday. So consider subscribing to this channel, like this video and share it around. It really helps us get our content out to more people. So with that being said, let's get right into it. Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights. So what are they? Well, basically they're just a bunch of pissed off particles that get ejected from the sun, come into the magnetic field of the earth, and then they put off a lot of heat when they interact with other things and make pretty lights in the sky. So in not so basic terms, the sun has an event like a CME or a coronal hole, it shoots out a bunch of particles through space at an extremely high rate of speed. So that makes the solar wind. So when that goes through, if it's earth facing, it's gonna hit our magnetosphere and the weakest points are at the north magnetic pole and the south magnetic pole. So it gives you the northern and southern lights. So with uh, the particles, when they hit that, some of them make it through. So it depends on the density of them and how many will get through and a couple other things we're gonna cover in this video. And then once that those get through the magnetosphere into our atmosphere, they react with oxygen and nitrogen and depending on the height in the atmosphere, it's gonna give a different color. So um, oxygen might be a green or red, depending on where it's at, but then you get like your pink, blue, green, white, um, just a whole bunch of different mix of colors that will give you an amazing light show. So stuff I'm gonna cover in this video is mostly about chasing the lights in Alberta. Um, my wife's from there, so that's kind of where we were based out of when we started doing this a few years ago. And we've seen them a bunch of times since then. And we have seen them in Montana and BC but nowhere as close to as many times as we've seen them in Alberta. And there's a lot of places you can see them in the United States, most notoriously is Alaska. You can see them in Montana, North Dakota, Minnesota, Michigan, basically all across the border of Canada in the lower 48. Um, all over Canada, there's the Auroral Oval, which I'll, I'll get to next. And then um, worldwide places like Finland, Sweden, Norway, they have some amazing um, views of them there as well. So let's talk about the Aurora Oval. The auroral oval, auroral belt, or auroral zone. Um, you can use whatever term you want. There's a bunch of different things that people call it. So what that is, is it's a giant ring around the magnetic north pole. Being in North America, the oval covers more land mass at a lower latitude compared to Europe, which it's at a higher latitude. For instance, you might seem really good over Calgary one night. That's latitude of 51 degrees. So if you go on the opposite side of the world of Europe, France, Germany, Ukraine, all those places line up with 51 degrees, the same as Calgary. Um, those are a lot more rare to see there. That's up more towards the Arctic Circle by Sweden, Finland, and Norway. So with the difference in latitude, and I think that those are around 61 degrees. So it's about a 10 degree difference in latitude. So it's the way it offsets on the earth and the way the oval sits. So that's kind of how it works when, why you get a better chance of seeing them in North America. So let's talk about all the data and what it all means. And we'll do it in very basic terms. And I'm gonna start with the KP index. The KP index is a scale from zero to nine. It shows the disturbance in the Earth's magnetic field caused by solar wind. So the faster the solar wind, the greater the disturbance will be in the magnetic field. So basically a KP zero would be really quiet auroral activity and a KP nine would be like an insane solar storm that would knock out cell phones and cause all kinds of problems. And you probably see them here where we are right now in Southern California. Solar wind speed and solar wind density, those are pretty self-explanatory. It's just the speed of the particles going towards Earth and how dense the particles going towards Earth are as well. So the BZ is a scale of a negative and a positive. Um, what you want is a negative BZ. You can still get lights with positive, but it's gonna be a lot less than if you had a really good negative. Um, basically the way that it was uh, described to me, so I'll take these two uh, magnets. So when it's a positive, they repel each other. So they're not gonna stick to each other. Um, and when it's a negative, it's like putting them back to back and they connect. So that's drawing the particles in and that negative will have those particles connect and the positive will repel them. So again, you can have them with both, but it gets more intense with the negative. And the BT, that's the total strength of the magnetic field. So that one you want to have a positive because that's going to have a higher strength to pull more of those particles in. What all those numbers mean? I have no idea. That's way above my pay grade and I'm sure you can read all about it online. It's just a lot of information on it. So with that basic knowledge, it gives us a picture of what's going to be forecasted in the sky that night. There's a couple different things that we use and some apps and some um, Facebook groups, uh, which I'm going to cover and I'm going to link in the description of this video. 
So the first thing we're gonna look for is cloud coverage. So if there's any clouds, you're not gonna see them, simple as that. But we use apps to maybe find an area that has less cloud coverage or anything that if we wanna drive. The one that we used the most was dark sky maps and they took that out of the app store this year and it's gonna be no longer supported at the beginning of 2023. So I think they said in March, so in a, about a month and a half of me filming this video. Um, I just suggest going to Google and searching for cloud coverage. I'm sure there's a ton of things on there. I know that some weather apps have them and will give you cloud coverage um, up to date and forecasted, and that can help you plan your night. The second thing we use is light pollution map. So that will give you a great idea where you want to go have your best viewing spot. No clouds in a dark sky is ideal. So with the different colors on there, it's color coded and it can show you from an area of very high density light pollution to basically a dark sky preserve. If you get both of those in line, the no clouds and dark skies, you're going to have a better chance of seeing them. The third thing we use is actually a couple apps. So the first one is going to be Space Weather Live and the second one is the Aurora app. This shows us the Aurora Oval, the KP Index, the Wind Speed, BZ, and BT. We check them both frequently as we're out looking for them. Um, this will also send alerts to your phone to let you know the probability in your current location, or you can pick a location to uh, like drop a pin on it and it will tell you what the probability is there. So for instance, if we're in Calgary and we're going up to Edmonton, we can drop a pin in Edmonton and it will tell us the probability of viewing the lights once we get up there. And the last thing that we use is Facebook. So we use a group called the Alberta Aurora Chasers. So what it is, is basically a bunch of people in a Facebook group that will start a discussion thread for that night and they'll be posting pictures, up-to-date data. Um, the people that run the page are super informative. They'll be commenting on there, kind of giving you a heads up about what's happening, explaining some of the data, what all this stuff means. And they're more than willing to answer questions for you. And um, basically people will just post pictures and talk and we just check that and see if it's gonna be a pants on or pants off kind of night. So you've checked everything. It's looking like it's gonna be a good night. You found your spot, so you're gonna get on the road. So what you wanna do is bring some snacks, go get some coffee, go bring some energy drinks, hit McDonald's at 1 a.m. cause this isn't gonna be an early night. You're gonna be out there literally all night. If it's in the winter, it's gonna be cold. So you're gonna to wanna to dress for it too. So layer up, uh, dress for the current conditions that you're in for that. I know you're just going out to look at the sky, but yes, this can actually be dangerous. If you think about it, you're driving in probably winter at night on not good road conditions to try to find the darkest place that you can that probably doesn't have cell service. So a couple of years ago, there was actually some chasers in Alberta who got into a car accident and they were killed. So slow down, drive safely, and keep your eyes open for wildlife because you're gonna see deer, moose, elk, bison. If you're going to Elk Island National Park, which everyone seems to go there for some reason when you can literally go to the street past it and not sit in a traffic jam. Um, but just be prepared because if your car breaks down or something happens, let someone know where you're going. Um, if it's in the middle of January and it's a cold snap, just be prepared to be out there until the help arrives for you. So like I just mentioned about wildlife, if you're driving, keep your eyes peeled because you're probably gonna come across moose or a bunch of deer or some elk. And if you go into Elk Island National Park, you're gonna see all the bison in there. So give those guys space. Um, I really don't wanna know what it is like to have one charge you because they will and it probably sucks. Also be aware of dangerous wildlife. So coyotes, wolves, cougars, um, most likely if you're chasing in the winter, you're not gonna see any bears. Uh, if you do in the late spring, um, early fall, just have bear spray with you. Know how to use it or a bear banger and again, know how to use it. Um, we've had two encounters with uh, cougars and one with a wolf. Um, none of those times were fun. Um, basically just packed it in for the night and went home because it's not worth it being in that situation. So know your surroundings and uh, just pay attention. So let's talk about etiquette. So I've seen people say, what time are they gonna be out? or I need to know exactly what time they're gonna be out so I can set an alarm because I have to work tomorrow. The truth is no one knows, and this is gonna be an all night thing. So if you're hitting the road and you're gonna go out and find a spot, you're probably not gonna get home till four or five o'clock in the morning. Some of the best nights that me and Amber have seen them have been between 12 and 2 a.m. I'm not saying you can't see them at eight, but you might see them at five as well. So this is an all night thing, you just gotta plan for that. When you get to your spot, turn your lights off. 
I can't tell you how many times I've seen people do this. It's actually very rude. It's all about darkness and keeping your eyes adjusted to the dark. This, not to mention if there's a professional photographer there who's taking like a time lapse or someone else's first time, it's just common courtesy. You're ruining their shot. You're ruining it for the other people around you. Now, if you're in a car that the lights don't turn off unless the car is off and there's a ton of people there, go find another spot sucks but you're just gonna have to do that because that's the right thing to do for the people that are there already parking so don't just stop in the middle of the road um go find somewhere safe it's gonna be nighttime so find a shoulder or a turnout or a parking lot somewhere that's gonna give you a safer area to do this i'm not kidding we actually have seen people stop dead center in the middle of the road just to get out and take a couple pictures and it jams everyone up behind them um with that being said when you get to a spot and there's someone there already don't park five feet away from them. Uh, again, you might ruin one of their shots when you pull up with your lights on. Um, think of it like fishing. If you're fishing somewhere, you don't want someone to walk up two feet away from you and go, hey, how's it going? And then just toss their line right in the same hole that you're fishing. So common courtesy goes a long way. And I'm not saying don't talk to anyone when you're out there because we've met some awesome people from all over the world that are out there willing to stand in negative 40 degrees to look at some cool lights in the sky. And the final and most important thing, don't get your hopes up because you can have all this information saying that's going to be some crazy amazing night where it's going to be the whole sky is pink and red and green and blue and yellow and whatever and a kp9 and you get there and it's something that looks like a cloud and it happens um the data is just predictions it's not guaranteed so if you don't see it, try again or plan for another time to do it. And if it doesn't line up for you, just keep trying. You'll eventually see it. If you follow these tips and what we do, hopefully it increases your chances of seeing the Northern Lights. So for us, it's definitely an indescribable experience when you actually see them. We've seen them numerous times and it never gets old. So hopefully you can experience that. Hopefully you took a few things away from this video that's gonna help you when you go out and look for it. Remember, stay safe, stay warm, bring snacks and extra batteries and phone chargers because you're gonna need them. Hopefully you like this video and if you do, consider subscribing to our channel and until next time, get outside.